you know, there's not that many horror games. No, really, I mean, if you exclude everything with zombies, there's just not a lot out there. And if you're interested in American Gothic horror, you know, Sleepy Hollow, Edgar Allan Poe, that kind of thing, there's really not a lot of choice. Enter the stage. A Touch of Evil by Flying Frog Productions, a game in which you're going to find yourself in the sleepy town of Shallowbrook. Alas, not all is as it seems, for the townsfolk have been terrorised by some fiend or other, and it's going to be up to you, with or against your friends, to investigate this matter and put an end to it. This is a game that's trying to sell you almost exclusively on its theme. And to that end, every component that you'll find in this box is a brush stroke on a tapestry that's trying to build you up this picture of Shadowbrook, this village, this place that you and your friends are going to inhabit for a little while. Case in point, just look at this board. It's just ridiculously beautiful. It's an old tiny map of Shadowbrook, replete with all of these just incredibly unnecessary details. You can see the chickens and goats scratching around in the, the farmyards. It's absolutely wonderful. In the centre of the board, you'll find the relative safety of Shadowbrook, a town in which you can do whatever it is one might normally do in a 19th century town, such as visit the doctor, buy items from the blacksmith, or train your cunning at the magistrate's office. Outside the village, you'll find less safe and spooky areas like the abandoned keep, the manor, or the old woods, which must be really old because there's an E at the end of the word old. These places are where the majority and meat of your investigations are going to take place and they all function basically the same way. You'll travel there and then you'll have some sort of random encounter, which might be anything from fighting some sort of apparition to discovering some treasure or secret passageway or even meeting a potential ally. Now this beautiful presentation of the board is kind of emblematic of the production quality that you're going to find right throughout this game. But since we're talking about the production quality, we have to have a quick chat about the art. All right, guys, why don't we address this right off the bat? The cover art on the box probably engendered a fairly strong opinion in you the moment you saw it. So here's the deal. Flying Frog have a kind of shtick with their games, and that is that they all revolve around some sort of B-movie trope or idea. In this case, it's horror. One of the things they do to try and pull out that cinematic experience they're going for is they employ live-action artwork throughout the entire game. Well, that means that every card and uh, character sheet that you get is going to have an image of an actual real person in full costume with props and a set with other actors and things like that. And it's very distinctive. And it also gets a lot of flack online. A lot of people really don't like this stuff because it's quite cheesy. With me, I love it. I, it's really cheesy. It's exactly the tone that Flying Frog are going for. It's, it melds with the game perfectly and it's very distinctive. It's also very novel and that's something that I really appreciate. It's lovely to see a production company trying to go in a different direction with this kind of thing. You can see an, a card and say that's Flying Frog straight off the bat. It's, it's great. Um, it also allows them to do some very interesting stuff. You know, you can have ca characters have cameo roles and actors come from other games. You can have weird things like you can see a prop in a, in a card and your, your miniature can be holding it. It's some really, really nice, interesting stuff that can happen here. But hey, if there's one thing that's subjective in gaming, it's this stuff. It's the artwork. And there it is. You will either love it or you'll hate it. Here's the thing. I bet you're not indifferent to it. Uh, see, from my experience and from talking to a lot of people online, people tend not to go down the middle with this. They really enjoy it or it's a big off-putting thing for them. It's worth thinking about because it's so heavily integrated into the game all the way through it. The trouble is, the art is not the only divisive thing about this game. 
Okay, here we are in the middle of a game. We're having fun. Look at all these bits, dice and cards and stuff everywhere. I am a strong, independent woman who acts and dresses as she pleases, regardless of societal pressure or indeed physical necessity. And you are a playwright. A simple task for someone of my talents. And look, you've already picked up some items and you've got some investigation, some clues. This is the stuff that you use to buy more items and services and eventually track down that evil headless horseman who just last night was seen making a deadly ride towards town and has murdered someone on the road. Look, but he's left some clues at the crime scene. So what do you want to do? Do you want to go investigate that crime scene? Maybe pick up some more of this investigation or maybe explore one of these dangerous areas outside of town? Well, here's what you're going to do. You're going to pick up a die you're going to roll it, count the number of pips, you've got one, and that's how far you can move. This is a mechanism we call roll and move. Seriously, this is a roll and move game. Now obviously it's not so bad that you need to land precisely on a particular spot to end your turn there, but it does mean that every turn your choices are arbitrarily limited by a system that you have very limited control over. And it just boggles my mind. Now, as a general rule of thumb, something that a good game will do to keep you invested and interested in what's going on is it will allow you agency in its little game world, normally through choices that you can make that impact that game world and change what happens. Now, the number, type, and quality of those choices tend to be the bedrock on which a good game stands, and they go a long way to shaping and moulding the overall experience that you've got. Change the choice variables, and you change the type of game that you're playing. And one of the reasons that modern design left the roll and move mechanic behind decades ago is that it allows fate to reach your hand into the game and tear out all of that agency that the rest of the game has been designed to provide you with. It sticks out even further here because in this case we have a game that's pushing theme in your face in every facet of the experience. So why then, if we're both on the same spot, do I have the world as my oyster, the option to go almost anywhere, while you can only hobble an inconsequential distance? It doesn't really make much sense. And the designer actually acknowledges this problem because if you do roll a one, you get a little consolation prize. You get to draw one of these event cards which normally confers some sort of useful ability to you. But if I had the option of actually playing the game, getting to do something, or picking up a card, I'm pretty sure I know what I'd like to do. And ultimately all that does is transfer the bad roll to a 2, because a 2 is normally as useless as a 1 to you, and you don't get a card. But you won't always roll a 1, sometimes you'll get lucky and roll a 6. Aha, well now you've got options, good times! Except the quality and impactfulness of those options is also important, right? So. Which of these four corner locations do you want to visit? I'll, I'll help you out, uh, it, it doesn't matter. See, there's, there's no way to make an informed or strategic choice about where you go, because when you get there, there's just no telling what's going to happen. It could be fantastic, it could be terrible. It's all down to a flip of a card. The only thing that really guides your hand is the fact that you can only carry one item from each location for some reason. So if you've already got a book from the windmill, there's not much point going back there. And that hardly sounds like the grand thematic experience promise, does it? Another fairly bizarre design choice, given the theming, is that the standard game has you in direct competition with all of the other investigators. So, okay, you might have some sort of personal issue with Carl the Soldier. You might have a basic fundamental difference of political opinion that's not conducive to a good working relationship. But actively working against his efforts to stop these murders and crimes? Who's the real monster? So it's thematically a bit wonky, but mechanically it's quite brilliant. You see, over time the villain is going to get stronger and more belligerent, and that means he's easier to find. Basically, he reduces the cost of these layer cards to buy, which once purchased means you can go to the secret location given on the card, pay some more investigation, and initiate a final showdown against the villain. So you just wait, right? I mean, you just wait until these get cheap and use your resources that you're saving to beef up your character and buy new items. Well, that's all well and good, except if old Carl already has one of these layer cards, well, he could be a turn away from winning. 
Of course, if he doesn't have so many weapons, he's not so strong as you, maybe he'll fail in his attempt to take down the villain and just weaken him up for you to take a crack at him. So, despite what it might look like, this is actually a race game with some push-your-luck thrown into the mix. The exciting elements come from that constant weighing of whether you should go for the villain now before someone beats you to the punch, or wait, biding your time, healing and building your character up and investigating the village elders. Ah yes, the village elders. See, when you eventually start your showdown, you can round up a hunting party from the village to help you. Up to two of the town's upstanding leaders can come and lend their aid, and that can be tremendously beneficial, because they all have some sort of unique and useful power, like healing, nullifying some of the villain's powers, providing greater combat abilities, that kind of thing. The trouble is, like most leaders, they each have a secret or two. Now, some of those secrets were fairly benign and won't really have any effect at all. Some of them will reveal that elder to be practically useless. Others will reveal them to be a hidden powerhouse or one-man army. And occasionally, it will reveal them to be evil or in league with the villain or even the villain himself. Now, taking one of these guys along with you on a hunt would be absolutely disastrous, as they will be revealed as a twisted version of themselves, lending their strength and powers to the opposing side. It really is a neat mechanic, particularly when you realise that when you start a hunt, any other player can accuse one of the elders of their evil deeds, and if they're right, that elder will reveal themselves and join the other side. So it's obviously extremely beneficial to know the secrets of all of the village elders, but learning a secret takes time and investigation, and those are things you just don't have in this game. You don't have enough of it to find all of the secrets, so you'll just have to be selective. But to be in with a chance of beating the villain, you're going to want to enlist the aid of at least one, maybe two of them, so you need to know that you can trust them at least, right? But what about all these elders that you haven't investigated, and other people have? you might be going up against something that's much stronger than you first anticipated. So maybe you should spend more time investigating some of these other people, then you're wasting your precious investigation and time. Uh, that is an interesting choice. It's a wonderfully interesting and novel mechanism, and if I had one complaint, it would be that I wish it would actually cast a longer shadow on the game and have even more impact. It's kind of a shame then, that it's rather enfeebled by the cooperative mode of play. Something that very few games are able to offer is the choice between having a competitive or cooperative experience. And the reason for that is that it's very difficult to design a system that lends itself equally well to both those gameplay styles. Now, A Touch of Evil actually does a pretty decent job of this, but with a few caveats. The game remains mostly unchanged, there's a few extra rules for trading items and cards that previously offered you a choice between hindering an opponent or gaining a benefit now just render you a benefit. Sadly the elders have kind of lost their relevance now, though as soon as you investigate one you just immediately tell everyone their secret. Once you've found which two that you want to take with you, you kind of just forget about the rest of them. The major issue is that in competitive play, you're racing against your friends and you don't know exactly where the finish line is because you don't know when one of your friends is going to go for it. In cooperative play, this race is replaced with a tracker. When it reaches a particular spot, you lose, so you have to defeat the villain before then. Now, this tracker moves up depending on certain events and cards in the game, but collectively you often have quite a few chances to send this clock backwards. This means it's really very easy for a good group to keep the villain in check and never really feel that time pressure excitement. Ultimately, things can become so relaxed and easy that the game becomes straight up boring. Now, of course, you can tailor this somewhat. You can reduce the amount of time it takes for the villain to win, but to get any real challenge, you're probably going to need to drastically reduce it. Still, despite that, I think I prefer cooperative play. It just feels right and it tends to tell better stories. And that's it. That's A Touch of Evil, a true Marmite game. You either like it or you loathe it. Now, I hope this review hasn't come across too negative. I like the game overall, but I do think it's really important that you know what you're getting into. And I hope by this point you should have been able to work out if this is the kind of thing that you and your friends are going to enjoy or if it's something you should strongly avoid. Now, this is a game that's heavily reliant on luck and there's no denying that because of that, this is something that a lot of people are really going to dislike from the encounters to the 
to the battles, it's, it's heavily luck-based. It's one of the reasons I actually prefer the co-op version because the luck kind of evens out across the group. A Touch of Evil really demands that you as players enter into the spirit of the experience. It even includes a CD of themed music to help you do so, even if it is as maligned as the art. If you are able to get into that mindset, it's possible to look past some of these shortcomings and find yourself a really fun little experience. It can be tremendously exciting and interesting to go to the windmill and have no idea what's going to happen until you flip over that card and then you have an adventure. It, it is a bit silly wielding three guns and a slingshot all at once, all together, but then it's fun to roll 20 dice simultaneously. The events that happen can be a little disjointed, but when they work, they can really help you tell this great grand story about your hero's fight against the villain, and it really lends itself to some great role-playing. All of this is enhanced by the tremendous production values, superb miniatures, and evocative artwork. Now, this is not something that I want to play all the time. You really have to be in the mood for this kind of experience. And there aren't many games that are going to offer it to you with this American Gothic horror theme, nor offer you the option of playing competitively or cooperatively. It also offers quite a bit of replayability value given the choice of heroes and villains, each of which can play very differently depending on their own unique charts and cards, which dictate their personal strategies, tactics and minions. Now, if you are interested or you already own it, you might like to know that as with all of Flying Frog's games, it's heavily supported, with a number of big box expansions and a number of small box expansions available, all of which add plenty of new content, like new heroes and villains and locations. So, should you buy it? Well, it's an odd one. I can't give it my wholehearted recommendation, there's just too many divisive elements, but it is going to stay in my collection, at least for now. I mean, it's always going to get at least one play per year. How long is it till Halloween?